Welcome to The View from a Pew, a conversation among Christians who are out to grow their faith by asking the simple questions, the tough questions, and the stuff you really wish your pastor would talk about. Come on now, let's reason together. It's your voice we want to hear. The phone lines are open, so join the conversation. Call 855-244-0077. That's 855-244-0077. Now, here's your host. J. Michael McCoy. Uh, good afternoon. This is View from a Pew, and I'm your uh, fill-in host today, Frank the Voice Holzhauser, filling in for J. Michael McCoy. Uh, this, of course, is View from a Pew, 99.3 KTIA, powered by webcast1live.com. Uh, joining us today, uh, of course, is, is Bob uh, Montserrat. And uh, we have a guest today, Bob Chonka, and he's you've been on the show before, correct? Yes, yes I have. And um, you've been here a couple of times, and you was you was saying. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for those of our audience uh, who 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 don't know who you are, uh, could you introduce yourself a little bit to the audience? Sure. Uh, my name is Bob Chonka, and uh, where do you start? Well, let's see. In 19... No, I won't go that, that far. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me just start with uh, my salvation experience. Okay. So the people know who I am, where I'm coming from. In uh, 1987, that's when uh, the Lord came to me in quite a miraculous way. Uh, I like to compare it to very much like the Apostle Paul. Um, it was uh, a very clear, very definite moment in my life that uh, the Lord presented himself to me as the Son of God, that forgiveness was through him. And I could have articulated at the time, but I knew everything that he was revealing to me, that I was brought into his kingdom. He was the king. He was the Lord. My life wasn't about me anymore. It was about him, and it was a journey. So since 1987, uh, my life has gone in so many different directions, and it's all been uh, just simply walking with the Lord. And a little over a decade ago, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the Lord put on my heart that it was uh, time to drop my nets once again. And uh, I was uh, a business owner and doing quite well. And I simply quit work and I went to seminary. And for eight years, I was uh, around here in the city of Des Moines uh, discipling. Uh, a lot of people may call it counseling as part of it, uh, helping uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord to work through their, their hurts, their pains, their wounds, their deceptions, um, even demonic uh, oppression, uh, so that they could have a stronger walk with the Lord. And that's how the Lord was using me. Had no job, no income, and for eight years, uh, the Lord was just extremely faithful. So then in the last few years, the Lord has uh, put me back into the business world uh, to be able to uh, pay for bills, just like you know anybody else. But I, uh, because of that, I have uh, extreme flexibility, so I'm still able to disciple as the Lord leads me to do so. Would you, uh, Mac would call it a mugging, but <laughs> would, did, did you uh, get what you would call an a offer you couldn't refuse? Oh, from the Lord? Yes. Uh, it was... Uh, not so much an offer as it was because I received it. Um, it, it here's basically what happened. I, I was not raised in a Christian home, so you know I, I thought Jesus Christ was a swear word. I mean, that's, that was about my upbringing. Uh, so we were very anti-Christian growing up. Uh, found myself uh, just looking for some meaning of life. I was in a rock band. I toured. I actually went overseas on USO tours. Quite popular. We were on the radio. Everything was, you know, looking like great success, but I was extremely empty inside and had no idea what was wrong with my soul. Um, The Lord appeared to me, and I had asked out loud, what do I need? And in that moment, I saw the word inscribed on my forehead, as clear as you can read any, you know, paper in front of you, and it said, forgiveness. And I heard God speak audibly into my right ear, 
and said forgiveness at the same time. I collapsed on uh, this bed that I was kneeling next to as I was praying, which was extremely unusual for me. Sure. And I felt like a fire hydrant was water gushing out of me, and I could see objects coming out, and I knew that was sin. I knew I was being purged out. I had no idea what it meant, but I knew it was happening. And I knew that Jesus was right there, and he was the one that had that authority to forgive me. Mm -hmm. I knew nobody else could do it. He was the one, and he did it because he loves me. And I knew that I was in his now into his kingdom. So it was revelation without me being able to articulate. But I went around for two weeks. I got to share this. Okay. Telling people that God zapped me because I had no idea what happened. And and other than my description of God zapped me is I, I literally, with the person I was with, I said, my chest is bigger. I am bigger. God put something yeah. in me. I ran into the bathroom, opened the door to look in the mirror, and I'm looking at my profile, and I'm going, my chest is bigger. He put something <laughs> in me, not realizing it was his own spirit. Well, now, you mentioned that uh, you come from a family who, who weren't believers. Correct. Have you had a chance to witness to your family and is any of your or minister to your family, and has any of your family since came around to join the Lord's service? Well, it's been an interesting uh, journey. My uh, father passed away uh, over a decade ago, and uh, right before he passed away, he knew I shared everything that happened with me. He saw the radical change, and uh, before he passed away, within a month, he uh, he confessed. So that was awesome to see that. My mother passed away, I think, about five years ago, and... I was able to, because I was shepherding here in the city and didn't have a job, I was just able to be here. And uh, the Lord provided a way for me to go down there. I was down there for a month spending with her. She had leukemia. It was, uh, I knew the time was coming. And just uh, a week before I left, I saw the, the transformation because at that, to that point, my mother was, uh, there is no God. That's it. It's over with. I did the best I could. And that was her attitude. I went into the hospital, and I almost didn't recognize her. There was, there was literally a, a physical transformation. It seemed like she lost 10 years. She was so responding so differently other than somebody with leukemia. She seemed healthy, and she had a lot of bitterness, anger, resentment, and unforgiveness. And she said, Bob... I put all of that into God's hands. Wow. I am ready to meet him. And there was some other things that came about that uh, through other brothers and sisters that shared dreams. So many things led up that I and, and, she, she came to know the Lord on her deathbed. And I'm sure that filled your heart with joy. It did. And I've got two other siblings that are, I would say, they're, they're walking down the hallway, coming to the door to knock. Yeah. So... But you know what? The Lord is great, and I'm not worried about it because their eternal well-being is on his shoulders, and that's where I want it to be. Okay, well, um, we talked a little before the show of some of the things that you have a passion about, and it, it reminds me of this story, and it happened back, I believe, in um, January of, the, of this year. And it's a story from the Indianapolis Star. Uh, I'll, I'll just highlight a little bit of it here. It's, it's, uh, I posted on my Facebook post. A U.S. police captain says he believed a story about a woman who claimed her children were possessed by demons. Latoya Amons from Indiana said her three children walked up walls, levitated, and spoke in voices. Officials' reports filed in 2012 backed up her claims with psychologists stating that they saw the nine-year-old speak in different deep voices and walk up the wall backwards. He flipped over a chair his grandmother was sitting in and landed on his feet. Gary Police Captain Charles Austin, who has more than 35 years of service, 35 years of experience on the force, said he had been convinced by the story. Officials uh, in Indiana document details, detailed more events apparently witnessed by medical experts and also DHS workers, those outside the family. 
Obviously, the children's names were removed from the papers to protect their identity. Medical staff reported they observed the children, heard the seven-year-old making growling noises. His eyes rolled into the back of his head. They observed him throw himself into the wall and nobody touching him. The report detailed that the seven-year-old walked up the wall in front of a number of medical professionals and um, ran into the grandmother. Uh, here, He had a weird grin on his face and began to walk backwards while the grandmother was holding his hands and walked up the wall backwards and flipped over. Then he charged the grandmother, hitting her in the, in the stomach, and she grabbed a hold of him and started praying. Is this common in the United States? <laughs> Wow. All right. This, that's a big question, Frank. Uh, let, let's, let's start with the bottom line. Is, are, are there unclean, evil spirits, demons uh, present today? And I'm going to be bold. I'll just be courageous because I'm going to speak my heart. And the answer is yes. Now, are there those that are going to have a hard time believing that? Absolutely. Are there those that, that's going to believe that there's an unclean spirit behind every door? Most likely there will be people like that when there isn't. But is there the presence of this? Absolutely. It's in Scripture. So if it's in the Bible, we should believe it, right? Why yes. should we argue against it? Now, what, what I see happening, Frank, at least this is from my own experience, this is what I observe, is that if these things are happening, you're going to have the medical field look at a person acting and behaving a certain way, and they're going to come to a conclusion that's medically sound. Well, there, there may be some chemical imbalance. Maybe it was uh, some traumatic experiences causing a personality a disorder. All sorts of reasons. You're going to come from different angles. But if we come from a spiritual uh, position with with the yearning and and hopes that the lord would open our eyes to these spiritual realities we would begin to see that the answer is yes that there is many uh demonic activities taking place i'll, I'll share an example a uh, a pastor another pastor here locally that uh, i've had uh, wonderful fellowship with him and he, we were talking about this about the lack of understanding and revelation about the spiritual warfare this other brother went over on a mission trip over to India where he spends the majority of his, of his life, um, where the Lord has called him. Well, one of his first experiences was, uh, you know, it's a little different here. You know, we have, uh, you know, we have neighborhoods, we have cities. You know, in other countries, they're villages, they're communities. They're, they're much tighter. Well, this, this man got out of his somewhat kind of hut, mm -hmm. and there was just hundreds of people walking around, which is quite normal there. And he woke up, and he stretched his arms, and just like he normally does, he says, Good morning, Lord Jesus. He was just talking to the Lord, and there was more demonic activity, people screaming and yelling, all the activities that you just described, because it's so rampant there. It's much more prevalent. It's much more open. It's visible. We don't see that here in the United States. I mean, when you really think about what are most brothers and sisters experiencing, they go to church on Sunday, they hear a good message, hopefully, right? Mm -hmm. And then by Sunday afternoon, they're watching football. Then Monday, they're busy at work. Tuesday, Wednesday, they maybe they go to a Bible study during the middle of the week. They're, you know, trying to live just good lives, but that that's the extent of it. And they don't understand that there's demonic activity that has followed their generations that is causing maybe the husband or, or the wife or both to argue, argue over trivial things or to lose their temper or to feel oppressed, de depressed. There's, I mean, look at depression. Look at, look at the commercials for depression. Is it just because it's a physical thing? And, and from my experience, I'm going to say the answer is no. It's not always that way. Uh, well, this has been uh, View from a Pew, and I'm your host, Frank Holzhauser, today, filling in for J. Michael McCoy, and we're on 99.3 KTIA, and that's powered by Webcast One. Bob Chonka is our guest, and when we, re when we return after the break, uh, we will pick up on this conversation of uh, the occult and demonic possession. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Thanks, no 
Visit eMetroFord.com for your guaranteed credit approval. Good credit, bad credit, no credit. Everybody drives with guaranteed credit approval at eMetroFord.com. Visit eMetroFord.com today. Get away from us, you mean old credit card. We don't have any more money. We're in trouble now. Save us! Help! Somebody save us! Somebody help! Help! Save us! <laughs> Hi, I'm Tom Coach from Consumer Credit of Des Moines. If your credit card's a little too animated, give us a call. Hooray, we're safe! Consumer Credit, you're our hero! Hey, psst. Let me let you in on a little secret. You ready? Always try to do business with people, not places. Especially if you seek honest Christian business people. And when it comes to my car, I really need to trust who's working on it. Now, my family is so blessed. A few years ago, we found a family-owned automobile repair shop that operates as a Christian business also. Open, honest, reliable, trustworthy. It's Amco on Hickman Road in front of Kmart. And it's a family-owned Christian operating business. This family treats your car as if it was their car. Everything from oil changes to transmission repair and everything in between. So the next time you feel the need to be at peace with your choice of who you can trust with your car, give Amco on Hickman a chance to serve you. And tell them Max sent you. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. We've got questions, you've got the answer. Join the conversation. It's your voice we want to hear. So call 855-244-0077. Now, here's J. Michael McCoy. And we're back with a view from a pew, and I'm Frank the Voice Holzhauser filling in today for J. Michael McCoy. And, of course, we're heard on 99.3 KTIA, powered by webcast1live.com. Today we're speaking with Bob Chonka. And, of course, uh, we have Bob Montserrat here and Ryan in the studio, or in the booth producing. Um, so, Bob, when we left, you was, uh, you was was talking about this conversation about spiritual warfare. Yeah. And um, you had some thoughts you wanted to continue with. Yeah. You know, uh, let me start with a, uh, a little bit of statement uh, with a question. Jesus said, I've come to give you life, life abundantly. So why are our brothers and sisters so unhappy? What, what's wrong? If he said, I came to give you life, life abundantly, why are brothers and sisters not walking in joy? Why are they not uh, earnestly and, and yearning to celebrate the death? Because the death, we, we died with him, which is, means our self-life is done. It's over with. And we were raised with him. We were raised with the creator of the universe, the living God living in us to give us life abundantly. And yet we're, yeah, yeah, work. Would you pray for me? Oh, my boss has been on my case. Oh, it's just, you know, it's, uh, I just don't like it. Well, I'm not... I think it's because people don't either understand that or believe that or are being taught that. And so they don't, they just figure that, um, 
It's they're as put, good as it gets. They're, they're put on this earth to make it on their own. Oh, yeah. but they got this reward at the end. But God gave them a brain, and they have to use it to try to get by. Yeah, and that, that and that's very common that I, I observe is that many people think they got to do a good job, be good people. Well, Jesus didn't come. I mean, if you really think about it, and I'm kind of getting worked up about this because I want to see brothers and sisters. So if you're listening out there, the only reason I'm on this show right now is I am just truly asking the Lord to speak something through me so that you're released from any type of bondage and oppression from demonic activity. You may not understand it. You may not even believe in it, but the Lord Jesus came to give you life, life abundantly. So is it safe to say your passion is the living God? <laughs> Absolutely. Jesus. I mean, what else is there? I mean, not not to be just to throw it out there, but if he's not my life, then what is? Well, what does our audience need to know about the living God? Well, you know, when we were talking to kind of bring it back to the demonic activity, you know, like I said, if you're out there listening, you, you may say, well, you know, I've never seen it, you know, and we're in the, you know, this is 2014, you know, that, that, that stuff was back in the days of Jesus. You may be saying, you know what, I, I don't really want to talk about it. I believe in it, but I think people might think I'm crazy. There's a lot of reasons why you might be not experiencing deliverance from it. The question to ask yourself is, are you feeling oppressed? Are you feeling depressed? It's not just a chemical imbalance. It's not because you're stressed out. Now, I'm not saying that it's 100%, but what I would encourage you to do is ask for revelation from the Lord to begin to open your eyes spiritually to the realities that are taking place because he wants to release you from that. Now, I'll give you an example of what uh, the Lord showed me for myself. I, and I was sharing this with uh, my uh, youngest son. And I said, imagine that, uh, you know, you grow up and you're going to become a police officer. And, but before that happens, you see this person, this man driving down the road and he's speeding through the neighborhood and you see little children. So you pull him over and you tell him, sir, you shouldn't be driving like this. You're driving reckless. You could hurt somebody, those little kids. And he says, who are you? Get away from me. I don't have to listen to you. And there's nothing you can do about it. So you then now go to police academy, you graduate, and they put something on you. They put a badge. And this same man happens to drive by, and you pull him over. And you say, sir, you're driving recklessly. You can hurt somebody. There's little children in this neighborhood. What, do you, what does he have to do now? He has to listen to you. You haven't changed. What changed? You were given authority. All right. What did the Lord say? What did he receive? He received all authority from the Father. And he says, all that I have, I freely give to you. So another question to ask is, when's the last time you exercised authority? So, Bob, do you, do you believe we have spiritual authority over demonic forces? And where they, we confront them, we have the power in the name of Jesus Christ, in the blood of Jesus Christ, to... to Move them, get them out of our way, or get them out of the way on behalf of others. Yes, I believe that. That's your question? Yes, I believe that. But I think part of the problem is that, uh, and I go back to the father that had this epileptic son, and the disciples couldn't drive out that demon or heal him. And so Jesus came and drove it out, but before he did that, <coughs> He asked the father, do you believe? And he said, yes, I believe, but help <laughs> my unbelief. And so I, I see that as, yeah, I believe you can do it, but I don't know if you can do it for me. I kind of see it that way. And there are many ways to interpret you know, Scripture. And so the thing is, do you believe you know, Jesus can do that even today? And, and I think every believer would say yes. But if it was for them in their situation, then there'd be the doubt. Then it switches, yeah, to, over to the doubt that most people don't realize that there's a lot of hurts and wounds that are distorting their own thought life. So, for example, if they feel and think about themselves that are unlovable, nobody really cares about me, I'm not important, I'm stupid, all sorts of false you know, lies that are, that are within them. So how can that person then say, 
well, but Jesus will give me the authority. They won't believe it, will they? Because how, why is he going to help somebody that's unlovable? Why is he going to help somebody that's unimportant? So the enemy attaches to that, as you know, Frank, you and I were talking earlier, that a generational curses that will take place is that that demonic activity will see that bloodline. This man, for example, feels very unimportant, unimportant. Nobody really cares about him. He has no significance for being here on this earth. He has children. What do you think begins to happen? It gets passed on, gets passed on, passed on. So now you go four or five generations. That, that demonic oppression is so strong and so real to them that they just think that that's what life is and about, never even realizing that it's all demonic oppression. Let me ask you, how, what does that look like when it's passed down? For instance, is it a matter of when you're young and you have kids and you say to them, you're not good enough, you're too fat, you're too ugly, you're too whatever, because that is what the parent heard when they were growing up? Yeah, you know, we're complex, that's for sure. Uh, you know, that is one of them is that the, what the parent is carrying will then be passed on to the child. I mean, <laughs> you know, many, many brothers and sisters, you know, when they get into the book of Genesis and they're going, oh, be God, be God, be God, be God, and they got be God, and they're just like, why is that even in here? Well, when you look at it really closely, Genesis chapter 5 says Adam begot Seth. Whoa, in his image. Well, what was the condition of Adam at that point? He was full sinful and fallen. So what was what's going to happen? So for example, if Adam, we don't know, I'm just saying, if Al, uh, Adam said, well, I'm stupid because look what I did. And if he's carrying that, what is he going to carry on? He may not directly say it, but he'll say it things like, hey, well, that was stupid. Why did you do that? Do you see? So it begins to manifest itself that way. So you're saying it's going to end up in the gene pool. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me ask you both a question, and, uh, and, and I don't know if, there's, if, there's any, if there can be any science on it, so it's more of an educated guess in your personal experience, but what would you say the percentage of, of uh, mental illness is demonic-related? You know, that, that, that another loaded question. You asked some really good ones. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if anybody could really answer that, uh, but what we can say is demonic activity is going to affect the mind. Why can I say that? What does the Lord say? He wants to transform us. How? By the renewing of the mind. So if the Lord's work is about the mind, who do you think wants to destroy that? The enemy. And what's he going to go after? The mind. So I, I'm basically proposing that a lot of mental illness, much of what's diagnosed as just simple mental illness, is most likely demonic oppression. To what degree? I don't know. You know, sin has entered our bodies. Can it uh, bring chemicals out of balance? Absolutely. Do we have iron deficiencies? Do we have? Absolutely. So can we have other physical ailments? Absolutely. Sin is entered. But the enemy, what do they want to do? They want to destroy. That's what the enemy, that's what it says, that he comes sure. to kill, destroy, to destroy, to steal. Yeah. What's of God? His right. children. He wants to take the children away. Well, poison them with evil thoughts. Yeah, you poison them with uh, bad food, bad diets. It's, what I'm saying is that if you have a chemical imbalance, uh, you can do that in the natural, in the flesh by being tempted to eat the wrong things that will cause you to have chemical imbalances. See, what I'm saying yeah. is there are different ways, but who's the one that leads a person to those different ways? I guess that's what I'm saying, is that we can see it in the natural, and if you don't fall into some of these traps, we know in the natural if you eat cyanide, you're going to die. Sure. You know, you, you know that if you do certain things, you're going to die. <coughs> But if you continue to live a lifestyle where you're doing the wrong things, drugs being one of them too, that causes 
imbalances. That causes mental illness too. Would you say drugs is 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 a very important factor in a, in in some of this? In that, what you would see under a normal circumstance, you would run from in fear. But sometimes, under the state of drug, you you might say it might not scare you as much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, dr- drugs. You know, to me, is a doorway. You you once you begin to start taking drugs mind-altering types of drugs, it's basically opening a door and just say inviting the evil spirits to come. And I'll give you an example. What one person, it, let's back up for just a second. The Lord says that this body is, is what? Temple. His, his temple. So again, if, if we just take this, you know, so we don't get into arguments. If we just say the enemy, the adversary, is setting out to destroy what God is building. He's building a temple. We are his temple. So he's the enemy's after it. This young brother had no idea that demonic oppression had been taken place. He was in a state of self-condemnation, continuing, continuing, and could not get past that he could intellectually understand Jesus forgave him on the cross. But he kept condemning, condemning, condemning. And I was waiting for the Lord. Reveal what you want to do. He had surgery. And they had to open up the back of his mind. So what happened to the temple? It was open. Now, to the enemy, they're, they're not going to say, may I come in, please? May I oppress you? Is it okay? No. Came into the brother. He was released. Condemnation gone. Well, this has been a View from a Pew. And I'm Frank Holshauser hosting today for J. Michael McCoy. And when we return from the break, uh, we will... Pick up this conversation on, I, w- I want to split a hair between harassment, o- oppression, and possession. And we'll pick that conversation up after the break. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner of Service Legends, and my position is Chief Talent Officer. I'm Nicholas Wondershad. I am Bernie Hobbs. And I'm the service manager. Marketing director and client relations manager. Everything that we do is about ensuring that we exceed your expectations. Our clients are important to us. 100% satisfaction. We're not just focused on heating and cooling. That's the easiest part of our job, actually, is fixing furnaces and air conditioners. Everyone that we come in touch with, we want to improve lives. Bottom line is, we've got our installation guarantees, 25% energy savings guarantee, comfort guarantee, temperature selection guarantee, property protection guarantee. 100% satisfaction guaranteed, fixed rate or it's free. All of those guarantees are backed up with a 100% money back guarantee to hold ourselves accountable to making sure that you get what you're after. Just fix them the problem today. If they have another problem five days down the road, it's still a fixed rate or it's free. We use what's called straightforward pricing. Our technicians are gonna give you an exact to the penny price on what it's gonna take before they move forward with any repair. That way you know what to expect. It's the same price every day. No surprises. If you get off work at five o'clock in the afternoon, you come home, you realize that, oh, my furnace is broken. Now you need to call somebody out that night. You shouldn't have to pay more for that. We're guaranteeing service 24-7. We run afternoons, evenings, nights, weekends. We're staffed to work that. Phone rings at 3 in the morning. You'll get one of our representatives answering the phone every time. We're not sending you out to Timbuktu in some call center. It's our service legend team members, our mission control team. I'll take a call anytime. And then they answer the phones same way during the day as they do at night. It's a great day at your service company. How can we make you smile? That's the only way to provide true 24-hour service. When you're able to let somebody actually live in their home safely when they weren't able to do that before, where they don't have to stay up at night and worry about, is the heat going to come back on? Are we going to freeze the pipes? Is the baby in the room next door going to be sick because they got too cold? When you're able to help somebody overcome challenges like that, that's impacting a life. That makes a difference. I get goosebumps thinking about it. I love the team. I love the people that I work with. (laughs) We have fun, but we work hard. I call them my ambassadors of legendary service. If you could just envision what that is, that's who we're sending to your home. They literally will call in, pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I want to talk to your manager. And I get on the phone, they're like, that technician that was at my house was the greatest technician ever. That's cool to me. We want to brighten people's days. Every person that we have going into the house has gone through an extensive background check. Drug testing, we have a very thorough interview process that one out of 140 people make it through. If we promise you something, that's what you're going to get, no matter what. We're here when you need us to protect the safety and comfort of your family. If you're not happy, we're going to make it right. 
If we're willing to put 100% money back guarantee on what we do, what type of work do you think we do? Give us a call. We're there for you 24-7, 365 days a year. Enough said. We're the ones in the pew, not pulpit. Come on now, let's reason together. The phone lines are open, so call 855-244-0077. Now, here's J. Michael McCoy. And good afternoon, I'm Frank Holzhauser, The Voice, and I'm filling in today for J. Michael McCoy, and we can be heard on 99.3, and that's power, uh, KTIA, and that's powered by webcast1live.com. And we've been talking with Bob Chonka, and Bob Montserrat. And um, Bob, I want to ask you, as, as kind of the expert on alcohol in particular and drugs, um, what's that your— That would be the other Bob. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do, you, do you think that this—how uh, do you think drugs and alcohol plays into um, some people's uh, ability to channel into evil? Is it, is, it, is it a detriment to people to mess around with that stuff and then— well, yeah, it definitely is a detriment. And <coughs> drugs are mind altering. Uh, they re they they cause a psychological dependence on them, and a physiological dependence. And uh, it you're you're centered on your next fix, and that's all you can think of. And you'll do anything to get that. You'll rob, steal, kill, whatever the situation is, because we all have voids that there's only one person that could fill that void. And if you don't know that one person, then you're going to do everything you can within the flesh to fill that void to make you feel better in some way. And so you do these mind-altering things for the excitement, to feel good about yourself, to make you feel better, and then it takes over your life. So you mentioned the mind-altering part. Do you, th do you think that's what would keep most people from from being afraid and, run, and turning and running from what they're visibly seeing or feeling and experiencing? That's what they're hoping to do. It's an escape, to take the drug, to alter your way of thinking because you're living under condemnation, because the world is condemning to you. I mean, and who is God of the world? The accuser is condemning you, and so you want to feel better, so what do you do? You do the worst thing you can to make yourself feel better. So you're dealing with things within the flesh. And the accuser is the god of our senses. Well, it's Satan. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, Frank, with, with that, if I could just kind of springboard off of that, you know, I don't want to come across as I've got all the answer, answers, because yeah, sure. I certainly don't. But what I'm convinced of is that when, when I said earlier that Jesus said, I, I've come to give you life, life abundantly. What if, this? and this is this is my own personal belief, but what if we were purposely designed by God for our hearts that we are loved, cherished, and special. And that he is the only one that can make us feel loved, cherished, and special. And when that need is not being met, we're going to go find it somewhere, but we never find it. So many that are have addictions they're, they're, they're trying to cover up the hurts. Why? Because they don't feel loved or they don't feel cherished or they don't feel special. They don't have a purpose. They're not unique. There's something going on in every one of us. We're looking to feel loved, cherished, and special. And it can only be done by Jesus, the Son of God, the living God. He lives in you for that very sole purpose so that you don't have to look anywhere. We don't have to go and search anymore. He's here. And so when it comes to what you said earlier about harassment, oppression, and uh, possession, po possession what, if, what, what would be the, the, the strategy behind the enemy harassing, oppressing, and possessing so that you don't feel loved, cherished, and special? They're going to harass you with thoughts. Oh, you know, oh, man, sometimes I just, you know, Wow, I don't know where that thought came from. Right. Just with, with common things that we might say, or, well, who does he think he is? Why did he say that? Why is he looking at me that way? Well, do you think that's just you're only you doing that? That's called harassment. Because when you start thinking about those thoughts, what does that provoke in you? 
Does it make you feel loved? No. Does it make you feel cherished? No. Does it make you feel special? No. What does it cause when you get harassed? You're, you're, you're going to get angry. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to be impatient. You lose self-control. That's what the enemy wants to do. And then as it becomes, and once they see that, oh, you're going to entertain my thoughts. Wonderful. I'm going to come out and hang with you all the time and begin to oppress a person. So anything to deter you from God. <clears throat> Absolutely. From interacting, engaging with the living God that wants to make you feel loved, cherished, and special. So I believe this is a lesson that ought to speak to all parents to validate your children. Oh, my. Oh, make Frank, them, now you're speaking. Make them part of you. Yep. And yeah. when they're part of you, they're not going to get caught up in gangs. They're not going to get caught up in other stuff. If they know they, if they know where they belong, and if we belong to Jesus, we're not going to get caught up in things. And if our children belong to us, they're not going to get caught up in things. Yeah, you know, parents, most parents, you know, they, they want to do the best they can, and many of them don't. I'm, I'm included. There was a lot of mistakes. In fact, I've always told my boys that <laughs> you're still going to go to counseling. <laughs> and But what I mean by that is that, you know what? As I learned to allow the Lord to speak through me to validate my two sons, that you are perfect. You, you have everything that you need to grow, to mature, and to walk with God. It's all there. You are all the things that you're going to hear from the world that you're stupid, you're a failure, you're no good, you're unwanted, you're unlovable. Those are all lies. He does not fashion you together. It, the scripture does not lie. He said that we are marvelously, perfectly made, fearfully made, period. End of story. You're perfect, period. And if we can validate our children as they grow, it's okay to make mistakes. You learn. You're perfectly designed to grow and mature, aren't you? Children, they know it. When they hear it, they know it. You tell them a lie, and look what happens to them. They begin to go into a and tailspin. What, and what's that called that you're describing? Just affirming them, well, telling them the truth. Discipline. And discipline. And, and that's what Christ has to do for us as, as a person, is discipline us, because what we discipline, we want near us. What we want to punish, we want to get as far away from us as we can get. But what we want near us, we want to discipline. So children are craving discipline. Mm -hmm. They're craving our attention. So that's a lesson for the parents out there. But let me ask you this. Why do you live? What makes you get up in the morning? What makes you breathe? Well, the, the simple answer is Jesus. <laughs> The, you know, Frank, that's, that's another loaded question. If we want, really want to get into that, you know, why do we live? <clears throat> you know, it, if we really understand what the gospel is, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I think, said it just wonderfully. He said the gospel is come and die. Come and die so that you can live. Right. That's it. So why do I live? Because Jesus lives in me. Because it, Jesus lives. He lives. He lives in me. He doesn't live in me to, to sleep in a hammock and take naps and occasionally go, oh, hey, you shouldn't do that. What what most, you know, brothers and sisters will say, the Holy Spirit's there to just kind of warn you, well, that's not, that's wrong. It, he's not a finger pointer. He lives in you. I mean, think about, this is how I, I think about it. If we were uniquely made, fashioned together, and were the image of him, He's the invisible God wanting to be visible in us and through us. So he knows how to uniquely live his life in us and through us so that he comes out of us uniquely. So let's imagine if you had a, a green uh, lens in front of you and Bob's was red and mine was blue. He's light. But what am I going to see? I'm going to see that color of him come through you uniquely. I'm going to see the different facet of God come through Bob. And when we see the light being lit up, who are we going to praise? Who's the focus? Where's the source? It's him. It's always him. So the more we die, the more we live. I mean, he, Jesus has told us, you want to live, lose it. If you think you want to live now, you're going to lose it in the end. So you're saying die to self. Die to self. Learn to walk the crucified life. It'll be the best thing you'll ever do, ever. 
Okay, well, this has been View from a Pew. I'm Frank Holzhauser, hosting today for J. Michael McCoy, and we've been talking to Bob Monserrat and Bob Chonka, and we uh, will pick this conversation up after the break, and I want to talk about uh, satanic power towards the end of time and how it will manifest itself and what we're going to do about it. Hey, psst. let me let you in on a little secret. You ready? Always try to do business with people, not places. Especially if you seek honest Christian business people. And when it comes to my car, I really need to trust who's working on it. Now, my family is so blessed. A few years ago, we found a family-owned automobile repair shop that operates as a Christian business also. Open. Honest, reliable, trustworthy. It's Amco on Hickman Road in front of Kmart. And it's a family-owned Christian operating business. This family treats your car as if it was their car. Everything from oil changes to transmission repair and everything in between. So the next time you feel the need to be at peace with your choice of who you can trust with your car, give Amco on Hickman a chance to serve you. And tell them Max sent you. Get away from us, you mean old credit card. We don't have any more money. We're in trouble now. Save us! Help! Somebody save us! Somebody help! Help! Save us! Hi, I'm Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of Des Moines. If your credit card's a little too animated, give us a call. Hooray! We're saved! Consumer Credit! Yeah! From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. We've got questions. You've got the answer. Join the conversation. It's your voice we want to hear. So call 855-244-0077. Now, here's J. Michael McCoy. And we're back with View from a Pew, and I'm Frank the Voice Holzhauser, subbing in for J. Michael McCoy today, and we can be heard on 99.3 KTIA, and we're powered by webcast1live.com. Uh, today we're speaking with Bob Chonka, and of course our uh, co-host, Bob Montserrat, Ryan producing. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, when Satan was first expelled from heaven, he's had roughly 6,000 years of exercise and practice to, uh, to refine his art. Uh, I, I've read somebody uh, that speculates that he may be as much as 10 times more powerful now than when he was originally kicked out of heaven due to um, practice, exercise, and regimented organization. By the time Christ comes... I think this could amplify to a hundred times, mm -hmm. my personal opinion. We're not playing. Well, this isn't child's play. We got one shot at this. It's a battle for the mind. Your mind's the battlefield. Whom you will serve. Elijah made that call. Choose ye whom you will serve that day, this day. If Baal be God, serve him. If God be God, serve him. There's this choice. There's this battle. It's a battle for your eternal life. What do you think we need to know as a, as, as a, as a Christian society? What, what do we need to do to, to, to battle for, for lives, for our, for our families, for our friends? Can we just leave this to chance and risk? Or do we need to proactively go out there and rescue? Well, when we look at, uh, you know, Revelation, there's, uh, there's good indication that the scripture talks about the the devil, the serpent, but now the dragon, and so or the beast, and so you see how he's growing in Revelation, and those that overcame him, they do it by the word of God, the blood of Lamb, and their testimony. So we get clear indication of how to overcome 
the the accuser of the brethren day and night. You know, so many many are not aware that that is what's happening, that he's an accuser. So we need to have what I what I think with, with this question, we need to have our eyes opened to the reality of what's taking place spiritually. We need our eyes, our hearts open to the reality of the living God living in us. Because otherwise, in, in simple terms, we're going to walk around as wimps. Because if you don't know who you are in him, you're going to be defeated. You're going to get the the hot bottle that you showed. Hot, you're going to be harassed. You're going to be oppressed and possessed. Would you say that it's it's time to be sober? Yeah. Vigil? That, v- vigilant? Being sober, you know, in Scripture talks about that, you know, we, we need to be woken up. That's what seems, you know, it, again, I don't want to come across as I know it all, but all I can do is I can just share my heart in that we don't need another uh, – <clears throat> We don't need another book written. We don't need another speaker. We don't need all of these things. Not that they're bad themselves. You know, the Lord does wonderful things through those things. But what do we need? We need to be awoken. If we're awake, because think about the testimony that's in this city right now. What do what does the outside look look at when they see brothers and sisters in this city? How are they walking? What, what do their lives reflect? They're, they're, they're complaining and they're dealing with the same realities as unbelievers are doing. And they're saying and doing the same things. They show no power. They show no reflection that the living God is in them, already having a perfect solution to every situation that they face. They don't reflect that. So if we're not awoken to the reality that we can walk in a resurrected life, if we're not walking that, what are we walking? We're walking in harassment, oppression, and possession. And the enemy will do what he's going to do. And the Lord, the good news, so you don't get you know a little bit freaked out here, the Lord knew we would be in this state. But it's not about looking at, well, that church over there or those brothers and sisters. Don't point. Ask yourself. Make the question come back to you. Are you walking in the power of his resurrection? Ask yourself. Because we all know that if you're going to make a change, it starts with you. Don't point to anybody else. Ask yourself, if you're listening to me right now, ask yourself and be honest with yourself. Are you walking in the power of the resurrection? Because if you're not, ask him. That's what he wants for you. Bob, is it is it apathy? Well, I think a lot of it is, getting back to what I said earlier, unbelief, that there is a living God that is there, that cares about us, like you were saying, Bob, that thinks we're special, that created us, you know, in his image and likeness. Uh, and I think it's a feeling of, I've got to do it on my own. If anything's going to happen, I've got to make it happen. And that's really not the way it's supposed to be. It's a total lie, because Jesus never said that. When you think about how Jesus walked on the earth, how much did he depend on the Father? What percentage? 100%. 100%. So why are we sh- be any different? We shouldn't. We right. should be depending 100% on him because he has brought us to the Father. So everything we need is here right now. So the enemy knows that. He knows his time is short. That's what Scripture tells us. So if you think you corner an animal, you think the animal is going to calm down, it's going to get worse. So to your point, Frank, the, the enemy knows his time is short. He is going to amplify his activity because he all he wants to do is steal, kill, and destroy, period. He is nothing but evil. Right. And if you look at the world today, if you look at what's going on in the news, you see that there's a lot of evil out there, and people are living in fear. Uh, well, Christ is our sacrifice, our advocate, and our brother. So if we've got... Christ on our side, who can stand against us? And do we have any excuse for not going out and rescuing souls? You know, it goes back to why did God create us? Who is he? Why does he want to indwell us? He, He has made his home in us. He's home. He's home. He's arrived. 
He lives in us. We simply need to accept that and let him clean house so that we are, are not asleep. We're, we're not wimps. We're not weak. We're not hurt. We're not wounded. We're not deceived. We're not manipulated. But we are walking with the living God. And he, there's nothing more that pleases him to walk with us in 100% continuous love relationship where he is telling you deeply into your heart that you're loved, you're cherished, and you're special. I'm telling you, ask the Lord to show you that. Well, amen. Uh, This has been View from a Pew, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Mac would like to tell you he loves his job and couldn't do it without you, and he would like you tonight to, to think of somebody that you have some ill will against, and he would like you to pray to forgive that person because we're forgiven as we forgive. This has been Frank Holzhauser filling in for J. Michael McCoy, our guest Bob Chonka, and Bob Montserrat.